Hey friends, welcome to the Old Fashioned On Purpose podcast. So I'd say that one of the biggest aspects of modern homesteading for many of us is this idea of raising our children in this lifestyle. I know if you're anything like me, um, children were one of the main reasons I wanted to begin homesteading in the first place. I wanted my kids to have that wholesome, old-fashioned uh, way to grow up. However, this idea of an old-fashioned childhood is much easier said than done in our current culture that really prizes helicopter parenting and hovering over turning the kids loose and letting them figure things out. So I wanted to bring on one of the foremost authorities on this idea of <laughs> free-range kids. So today I am so thrilled to have with me Lenore Skenazi. She is the author of the book Free Range Kids and the founder of freerangekids.com. She runs a nonprofit called Let's Grow, which is working to make it easy, normal, and legal to give kids independence. They've even changed some laws in some states and are working towards more free time for kids, which we're going to talk about a bunch in our interview today. So welcome, Lenore. Well, thanks, Jill. I feel like Oh, I'm talking to homesteaders and I'm here in New York City, but let's go for it. Okay. <laughs> Which I think will be all the more valuable because I know I have plenty of folks who live in the city too, and maybe feel a little okay. handicapped by they don't have a farm. So how can they provide these options? So I think it's gonna be good. It'll be good. Cool. Um, so I think my first question I'd love to get into with you is, you know, one of the things that I find most interesting as I look at homesteading history or even just the movement in our modern applications is I like to ask the question of kind of how did we get here? How did we get to this, this part of our modern culture where we think all these things are normal and many of them really aren't that normal? But in the case of right. how we now parent, which is so different to how people historically parented, kind of, can you explain the progression and how we got to this kind of abnormal place that we are in now? Yeah. How did we get to this weird point where it is almost considered um, immoral and illegal <laughs> to let your kids play outside, walk to school, uh, even play on the front lawn? I was just reading a study that asked 2,500 plain old Americans what age they think their kids can play on their own front lawn uh, or should be allowed to do that. And the average age was 10. <laughs> so that to me is kind of surprising considering I was walking to school yeah. back in the day at age five in the suburbs of Chicago. How did we get here? Um, in, in my free range kids book, I outlined four ways I think we got here, but now I think there's a fifth um, and I'll, I'll get to that one at the end. Uh, first is the, the media. You know, the media loves nothing more than yeah. the story of a white middle class or probably upper middle class child abducted by a stranger. It just became the go-to story um, starting around 1979 when here in my city, New York, um, Aton Pates was abducted from a uh, bus stop. He was six, never seen again. Back then, the working theory was that he'd been taken by a lovelorn woman who'd seen this angelic little boy and wanted to raise him as her own. So the predator story had not taken hold in America yet. But between his story and uh, which happened on a slow news weekend, I mean, it's horrible to say it, but it started on a, a Labor Day weekend. And then a few years later, Adam Walsh was um, taken from a Sears in Florida and his father's John Walsh, who started America's Most Wanted. And between those two, um, th there was a mini series done about Adam Walsh that broke all ratings records. And, you know, television is not there to inform you. It's there to make money. And of course, if something gets more uh, watchers, eyeballs, readers, whatever they are, um, the, they will do more of it. The executives recognize this is where their bread is buttered. And so... Um, not only did that become a staple of television, right when the television laws were changing and things that you used to never be able to see before, you know, dismembered bodies, even a toilet flushing had been illegal on television until like the 80s. But suddenly all the rules were gone. All the stories led to abduction. And at the same time, um, they started putting pictures of missing children on milk cartons. Do you remember this at all? It might have been before your time. Okay. And, and, and so yes, the, yes. the National Center for Missing and Exploited yeah. Children never explained that the vast majority of kids who go missing are runaways or taken in custody disputes. Not that those aren't dangerous situations as well, but it's not a stranger snatching them off the street, off their bike. So we got this mis, um, misrepresentation that we were living in a country where children were never safe the second they left their house. And that was reinforced over and over again by the by the news stories that would just you know follow a story like the John Benet Ramsey story for decades and then by things like Law and Order and all the other crime shows 
that um, your brain just takes them in and your brain works like Google. And if you ask your brain, um, you know, what's the best place to go for Mexican food in my neighborhood, which is Jackson Heights, Queens, you'll get a list of them. And, and it'll say, you know, this one has tacos and burritos or whatever. And, and it's relevant yeah. results for your search. But if you ask your brain, is my kid safe at the bus stop? Up comes Aton at the top. And then comes JC Dugard, who was taken from a bus stop in California 20 or 30 years ago. And so the scariest, worst stories fill that front page of search results. And because you don't have pictures or stories of everybody who was fine, right? You cannot picture 300 million children since Aton growing up and going to right. school, which has happened. And so um, the easier it is for you to remember or picture a story, the more relevant you think that story is to your life. And so we just now have these search results in our brains that are very much, thank God, at odds with everyday life for the vast majority of people, but really scaring us. So the media infiltrated our brains, filled it with scary stories, and now that is our reference point, no matter how off it is. So that's, that's one reason we're so scared. Um, another reason, I'm, I'm going to whip us through the other ones faster. We live in a litigious. <laughs> no, it's, I, I, I mean, I, I feel like that's okay. I don't want good. to bore people. Anyways, litigious society. Everybody thinks that they're going to get sued and nothing looks safe enough. You look at the Consumer Product Safety Commission, yes. what they recall. I mean, the, they recall socks that have pom-poms on them because the pom-pom could fall off and pose a choking hazard. Basically everything. I'm like, this could be a choking hazard. There's a tape dispenser, choking hazard, you know, nail clippers, choking hazard and eye gouging hazard. So, so everything just starts seeming dangerous because you've yeah. been um, sort yeah. of trained to think like a trial lawyer, like in a court of law, could I say that I really thought my kid was safe using this or that? I just saw the American Academy of Pediatrics said, you can't have anything in the crib anymore. You can't have a pillow. You can't have a blanket. You can't have bumpers. You can't have a toy. And, and that's sort of, wow. it's, it's both, real and metaphoric because that's sort of what we're doing to childhood is like, let's take everything out of it and then they'll be safe. So you start by taking everything out of the crib and then gradually you take out all the bike rides and all the hay rides and all the walking to school and playing outside and running in a ditch and climbing a tree. And pretty soon you're really safe and kids have done nothing um, until they're about 22. So litigious society. Um, yeah. Third reason we're scared is that, that we live in an expert culture. Usually I have my Usually I have a more interesting prop near me of, um, uh, you know, a magazine that has some crazy news story on it. Like, you know, is your child safe around a laundry hamper? And of course, the answer is always no. Your child is never safe no matter what. Um, experts are always telling you you're doing it wrong, which is what I hope I'm not doing. I hope I'm just showing that society is driving us crazy, not that we are doing anything wrong. And then the fourth reason is that we're in, um, you know, there's a marketplace out there. People 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 used to ask me it's like well are we always are we so concerned about our families because there's just so few kids these days and when we had 10 kids it didn't matter if a few of them died and i'm like i don't think that's that was not it it but when you have 10 kids and one income versus one kid and two incomes or two kids and two incomes that just means that there's a lot sorry there's a lot more time and money to be spent on each individual child and so the marketplace comes up with all these things you can spend your money on, like a spoon that changes color when your child is, when the food is too hot. There's, um, there's a baby bathwater temperature duck. You put it in the bath and if the duck says it's hot, quack, quack, it's hot, then it's hot and you couldn't possibly use your hand. So there's just a whole lot of new um, yeah. devices and products and toys that are all supposed to boost your child's development or keep them safe that you really totally don't need. And, um, and yet it's easy to get you to pay for them. If you can scare, uh, if you can scare you, <laughs> if the, if the marketplace can scare you into thinking that you need these things or your child will be, um, in pain or left behind. And then, um, the one thing I didn't really get to in my book that I, I think is interesting, but hard to put a finger on is that we, the, as culture goes along and as people get pretty well off, you start to think that you have control. And in, in a way, you do have control that you never had before because you have a smartphone. Many people do. And and with that, you can see where your child is at any moment. You can see, did they get on the bus? Did they take their Spanish quiz? How'd they do? What did they have for lunch? And um, with that sense of omniscience, nobody had that sense of omniscience until, until now. 
And, and you think that if you're that wise and knowing, you should be able to make sure that everything is good because it's all in your hands. And that's driving parents crazy because it means that anytime anything isn't perfect, it's your fault because you should have been watching, you should have intervened, you should have been there. And so the, the new normal is you're either there in person or you're there electronically because you must, you're God. Right. And you must be making sure that your child is doing everything correctly, including getting ahead at any given time. So those, I think, are the five reasons that um, you don't see kids just frolicking outside, um, except maybe your community. They do. I mean, I, I, I hope they do. I, that's why I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. The control piece is really interesting. Um, and I think. There's also like, a, I've noticed like a cultural component, of course, as well, where if something, if, I've even seen it in, in, you know, Facebook posts or comment <laughs> sections, which are always a dumpster fire, but you know, like uh, where something will happen, there'll be a news story. Like, um, I think there was a story a while back where a parent, she had a whole bunch of kids and she was loading groceries in her car oh. and she forgot a kid in the grocery cart for just a minute and started to pull away and she left the kid in the car, you know, really? and everyone right, right, right. Get me a she noose. shouldn't have done that, that <laughs> shouldn't have happened. How dare she? And I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, uh, she can't, number one, there's things we can't control. No like you said, but like, mercy. there's also no mercy of like, I think I could have done that. I mean, I've known there's days I've been scattered enough where I'm like, I could have done that. I, gotten gotten all the way home, home. I, I mean, definitely have forgotten yeah. things. Maybe a child. Right. I, might, I mean, it could happen. And yeah. And so I don't know, there's that cultural, like you have to control this all the right. time as well. And so a couple so things much. are going on in a story so like much. that. Um, one is we would have never heard of it before. It's so minor. Um, but now that there's social media, somebody can take a picture and it's always so delicious to add your thoughts. Um, two is this crazy idea that like, even if you did forget your kid, you know, nobody wants to do that. It's, it's not a, it's not a, a great idea, but if it happens, yeah. it happens. And it doesn't mean that therefore your kid is going to be abducted and you'll never see them again. It just means that they're going to be bewildered for a while. You're going to feel like a jerk. You know, somebody's going to call the manager. They're going to figure out, you know they're going to call the police. The police are going to find you. I mean, there's so many things that will happen. Um, none of them horrible, but um, it is written as if you've committed, as if you've thrown your kid into the lion's den simply by being distracted. I've, I've had parents write to me and say like, I can't believe it. I put my kid in the car at the grocery and then I was going to put the cart back in the cart corral and somebody yelled at me, hey lady, you're leaving your kid in the car. It's like, what are you supposed to do? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, you can't split the child in two and take half right. of it to the cart corral. So there's, there's so little forgiveness. And, yeah. you know, we used to blame rape victims. You know, we used to say, oh my God, she was asking for it. She was wearing a skirt that was too short. She was in the neighborhood at night. I would never go there. And then we gradually realized we're blaming the victims and we stopped doing it. And, and the reason we were doing it was so that it gave us a feeling of protection. Like, well, I wouldn't wear that skirt, so I will never get raped. I would not be in that neighborhood. I don't go out that late, so I'm safe. Yeah. And what we're doing now is the same thing with parents. It's like somebody says, can you believe she left her kid in the cart? And then like, I would never do that. What kind of mom does that? She should have her children taken away. Let's call Child Protective Services. It's all this same thing. It's like, trying to make sure that nothing bad happens to me because I'm piling on against her. And you put it best. You said there's no mercy. Yeah. Culture. Yeah. Oh, culture. Um, is it? Culture? I don't blame you. I, 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 you know, I just want to say one thing, which is like so, people think I'm an anti-helicopter parent. Yeah. First of all, they don't know that a helicopter. Secondly, I'm not I'm not anti-parent. I'm anti a culture that's made it so that the second you leave yeah. your kid in the cart or you let your kid wait while you're putting the cart away, there's a culture that is so unforgiving and demanding, especially of moms. And it is, I mean, I, I, I'm guessing that a lot of your listeners are moms, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So many, many um, are, yeah. it just yeah. feels like it's sort of a backdoor way of... Um, you know, putting us back in our place right in, during the the um, industrial revolution, when there were finally some labor saving devices for the home for the first time, like, a, I don't know, a, a vacuum cleaner or a dishwasher or whatever. Um, that's when, according to Rebecca Traster, who wrote a book called All the Single Ladies about how single women unencumbered by husband or children have been behind a lot of the social movements in America. Anyway, so so along comes some labor saving devices. And then pretty soon, 
the books come out that are way more exacting on how to keep a good house. They say things like, you might think there's nothing to folding a napkin, but actually there's quite a bit. And suddenly you're doing origami on the napkins. And it just feels like the minute you yeah. have like a little free time to breathe or do something else, lean in. Um, no, no, no. You better be doing more as a mom, as a wife. And so it feels the same now. I mean, you know, the seventies, people always think like, oh, we're afraid of having children run around outside now because back in the seventies, there were all the moms at home. And so if a kid, if something bad happened to a kid, all the moms were around, uh, uh, no, in the seventies and eighties was when the first, you know, when a big wave of women went to work and that was when the kids had, um, some freedom still. So what's changed is that now we say that if you're not with your kid all the time, um, they are in danger and we've made it into um, this, this new paradigm. I hate the word paradigm. I can't even spell the word paradigm, but we've made it this new thing that if you're not watching your kids all the time, your kids are in danger, you're doing a bad job. And if anything bad happens, it's all your fault. Yes, absolutely. Now, I've, I've heard this statistic float around. Is it true? Maybe it's inaccurate, but is it true that it, statistically uh, things are safer for children now than they were back in the, the time yeah, of childhood well, we idealize? Is that yeah, true? Like I mean, I can give you crime stats. And I first of all, you know that you're much safer in terms of like diphtheria and polio and whooping cough and things like that. Yeah. Um, Crime started going up towards the end of the 70s, and then it was going up in the 80s, and it peaked around 93. And then it came down in my city, New York City here. Um, we had over 2,000 murders in the early 90s, and recently we were down to the 300s. Now, I know that since COVID and craziness, there's been obviously an increase, mm -hmm. but it is nowhere near the, the peaks, thank God, um, that we hit in the 90s. So the statistic I like to use, and it was crunched by somebody who understands statistics, which I can't say I do, um, but it was if for some, like trying to understand how rare our biggest fear is, which is the fear of being our kids being kidnapped by a stranger, like a law and order thing. They call it a stereotypical kidnapping. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So the how long would you have to keep your child outside unsupervised? You're not there. Uh, for it to be statistically likely that they would be taken by a stranger. And I'll ask you, because if you haven't read my book, you won't know. Maybe you have read, maybe you've read my book and don't remember. Right? How long would it take? I mean, I have, I have, Good. I have ideal. Book. I don't right. remember. <laughs> but, um, yeah, that's yeah, the best. I don't remember what I read. It's awesome. Um, I don't know. Like I would imagine How it would long? be a long, a long time. Like you have to give me a, what a you mean time. by a long time. Many years. Like, okay. Uh, wow. 40. Um, first of all, high five. Um, because most people say, okay. <laughs> you know, some people think a day or two and some people think in terms of hours and some people think in terms of minutes. Hmm. There are people who think like it, you're, oh. you're, you're watching your kid, they're fine. Okay. And you turn over here to start making change for somebody you turn around and they won't be there because that's how it is on, on yeah. television. But in fact, the, the numbers that were crunched for me yes. by a guy named Warwick Cairns, who wrote a book called How to Live Dangerously. Anyways, the number is 750,000 years, um, which is sort of like how many, how, I know. Oh, wow. I know. I know. Yeah. And, and I like to think that after the first couple hundred thousand years, it's so, yeah. really not a kid anymore. Right? <laughs> right, right. Like older, <laughs> right? Not, not as cute. <laughs> like King Tut. So yeah. King Tut's only like 4,000 yeah. years. Yeah. I mean, you know, he's got a long time before he's abducted <laughs> by a stranger. Right. That's cool. um, yeah. So, so the thing is, yes. Yes. it doesn't matter that these statistics are shocking and real and enormous and your kids are safer than ever before. People think they're not safer in terms of walking to school because there's cars. There have been cars for a long time. Cars actually have better brakes now and they have better, fewer um, blind spots. The point is, there is no such thing as perfect safety. And I think that's another one of the things I guess I should have put yeah. this under the category five of like control, like the idea that if you do everything right, you can get risk down to zero and you can't. And there's this horrible phrase that you've said a million times in your own life. I have to better safe than sorry. And that implies you can be safe or sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but in fact, um, you can be safe in one way and, and that makes you a little less safe in the other way. Keep your kids inside all the time, you know, under lock and key and watch and smartphone and, and, um, babysitter and 
they are safe from something that they were safe from anyway, which is being kidnapped by a stranger. Um, but they're not safe from other things like diabetes and depression yeah. and obesity. You're sitting right next to the, you know, to the air, um, whatever that thing's called, refrigerator. And so um, when we start thinking that we can make a perfect childhood like that crib with absolutely nothing in it, once again, it's us thinking that we can control for everything, but there's there's so many factors that go into any decision and there's so much randomness in the world that it is, um, it's a fool's errand and it is taking something away from us, which is our trust in our kids and taking something away from our kids, which is the buildup of independence, curiosity and being part of the world as opposed to being safe like a little teacup in the break front. Yes, absolutely. And that brings me to my next question. Um, I did not know. I swear I didn't know. (laughs) It's random. Um, I know. I know. Uh, So I feel like a lot of people might, especially like I post pictures of my kids doing crazy old fashioned kid things and people are like, oh, that's so nostalgic or that is, you know, just like old fashioned childhoods and people kind of brush it off. as like, that's nice, but that's not how we do it now. (laughs) And I'm, my thing has always been I know we don't do it now, but we can't afford to leave this in the past because this is really important. And can you describe like, what is it doing to our kids when we hover and when we don't let them experience things? We're trying to uh, mitigate all risks. Well, I'm going to flip it around for a second and ask you a question, which is that, um, what did you like to do in your free time as a kid? Your unsupervised, unstructured time. What'd you do? Um, We rode bikes, played outside created, pretended ball games with, you know, non-structured okay. stuff like um, that. How, how, tell me about organizing a kickball game. Um, I mean, there was, a, because there wasn't an authority figure, we had to do, you know, you pick the teams and there was the question of who got the best kids and who got the weak kids. And there was that, 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 that you know, decision-making process. And then you had to work out the rules. So if someone did something that one other person thought was, Against a rule, you had to problem solve that, and there was nobody to fix it. Was it was it fun? Did you have fun playing kickball games? Really? Oh, it was a blast. Even though it sounds yeah, like it you probably had to argue. Yeah. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, and there were mm-hmm. hurt feelings sometimes, but it, I mean, we did it over and over again. Obviously, we thought it was worthwhile because we kept coming. Okay, back. and was everybody seven? <laughs> and then you know, was everybody the exact same age? No. 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 Big, big kids kid, who climb on kids. rocks. <laughs> yeah, strong kids. Even kids, kids with chicken pox. Yeah. Um, all it's all commercial. Um, so yep. Yep. what about the runty kids? How did they play? I mean, it sounds like they wouldn't know how to kick the ball necessarily. I think everybody had, everyone got a chance to figure it out. And, and looking back, I think there, it was interesting to see that even the big, talented, athletic kids still, there was always a chance for the little ones to play. Even if they knew, you know, okay, maybe they're not, they're not as good, but they still got a chance. And I think they would watch the athletic kids and pick up on some of those. And would the athletic kids yeah. kick it really hard to the little kids? Nope, there was adjustments made usually. Yeah, they really. Harder. Right, right. Kick it a little harder, you know. <laughs> yeah, like, really. I'm going to go right. for the head here on that. No, but, um, good, yeah. yeah, it felt like everybody always, yeah, no, everybody always came back even though. You know, there wasn't everything equivalent. Everyone thought it was worthwhile to keep doing it. All right. Uh, it was fun. It was fun. Yeah. And then also you explored and you, you rode your bikes and you found things. and Yeah. We did caught frogs, made forts. But there was an old abandoned railroad track, which sounds just great. Uh-huh. I played on the railroad tracks as a kid. And, you know, no trains, but it was behind the housing development. So it felt very wild and secluded, even though it wasn't that far away from the houses. But that was our favorite place because it was that little bit of element of like, excitement and there was no adults and maybe danger, even though there really wasn't much danger, but that was a favorite. Yeah. Um, it sounds great. And I think it was great. And I think when you ask what do kids lose by being supervised or by being in an organized activity all the time is everything. (laughs) What can I say? I mean, everything that you've just described to me, um, is so fantastic. I mean, the, the little kids learning how to hold it together and, you know, sort of copy the big kids, that's executive function, right? Maturity. And the big kids learning to, you know, be a little gentler with the little kids because what's the point of, you know, lording it over them if you're 12 and you're a great athlete and your cousin is four? 
you know, you're going to win anyway. So you might as well just, you know, kick the ball gently to her. Or I talked to one guy, who was he? I can't remember once. Uh, he was just saying how much he loved when he would play with little kids when he was a little older and they would, they would hit the ball to him and he's the, the soccer goalie and he'd go like, Oh, wow. It's just so strong. I can't stand. Yeah. And the kids would be like, yes. And so that's the beginning of empathy. It's the beginning of leadership. It's the, it's knowing how to read people. It's keeping everybody engaged and involved. And when you start talking about playing behind, there's, there's a, free range motorcyclist. I don't know if you heard that. Uh, I live. I, yeah. What can <laughs> I, I say? It's New York. Um, and then, and, good. and then good. the, 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 um, the abandoned railroad track and going out there and making up games and pretending it's the olden days with the train going by seems sort of like what you're doing today. <laughs> you know, you, you, it does. I think there was a yes. foreshadowing. <laughs> right. Well, the thing is, I think everyone has yeah. foreshadowing because in your childhood, when you have free time, you are drawn to certain things. And those things, if you're allowed to sort of get into them and do them just for fun, not for a grade or a coach or your college resume, but just because they turn you on, they can actually point you to a really happy, fulfilling life, um, often to your career. I was yeah. one of my favorite stories is I'll tell you, I'll tell you the most amazing one and then I'll tell you another one. Um, so one guy, successful businessman, I was interviewing and I said, what did you do for fun as a kid that you sort of see yourself still doing today? And at first he was unresponsive. I said, nothing. It's like, let's try a little harder. What did you do as a kid? And he's like, well, yeah. I, I played. I'm like, okay. What did you do that was really fun and specific that you sort of still do today? And finally he got sort of misty eyed and he said, well, he grew up in Miami fruit trees all over there. Sometimes the branches lean over the sidewalk. And so the, you know, the lemons and the grapefruits and whatever fall to the sidewalk. And then it's yours. You can pick them up. And, and, and so he did, he picked them up and he put them in his little wagon and he went around the neighborhood selling them. So he was selling other people's stuff. And that's Jeff Bezos. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, yeah, wow. there's something wow. there, yeah. but, but a more peculiar one is my yeah. friend who was, um, who told me that as a kid, she would go to the phone book back when there were phone books and look up a name and then phone them and say, excuse me, hi, I'm doing a survey. Can I ask how many of your children play a musical instrument? And this was her form of fun, which I would never have done that, but that was her thing. And now she's, she's nope, a, she's nope, a professor yeah. of sociology at the university of California, California, Irvine. And what does she do? She collects data on people wow. to try to figure out society. And and I have so many cool stories like that because I've interviewed a lot of people asking what is the thread from childhood to now. And if your thread is my mom put me in soccer, my mom put me in chess, my mom took me to ballet, you know, there's a chance that you will love soccer or ballet or, you know, somehow evolve into those. But but they're not quirky enough that they are just you. <laughs> right. And and the yeah. quirkiness is is you figuring out who you are and what you love to do. And once you figure out something that you love, then you're so turned on. I, I, I talked on one of my favorite teachers. He's now an assistant principal. He was mad because at the beginning of COVID, his son was sneaking into the bathroom with his phone. And what was he doing? He was always listening to podcasts about cars, you know, and this dad's like, he shouldn't be doing this. And I'm like, why not? And in fact, what he ended up doing was making his own, not a podcast. He made a blog about cars and so what he was doing was he was drawn to a topic and that made him want to read, want to listen, want to write, yeah. want to do research. Everything that we want for a kid to do, if we gave him an assignment, like, you know, tell us the, the history of the French Revolution. And so if you don't have any free time, if you're always doing something for someone else, you're, the chances of it hitting your sweet spot is small. And so kids need this this open-ended time and unsupervised because if we're there we'll say oh you're st you're studying cars here's a really good book i just got you a book on cars and i just got you a magazine on cars and let me help you read this about cars and let's underline and suddenly it becomes you because you're an adult and you're better at doing all this stuff than the kid even solving the arguments at the kickball game an adult would ruin it what you learned doing that yes. is yeah all the things you need to be a successful adult and the successful adults then have to recede so their kids can be, follow that same trajectory. 
Yes, man, that's so good. Um, and I absolutely like you were talking about the the kid who likes cars. When I was 15, I started a, my oh, first God. blog. And back then blogs weren't a thing. Nobody knew what they were. Like there was none of software. So I was coding it from scratch, like total nerd. And I was still like riding horses and doing other things, but I was spending all my time and my extra time doing this nerdy thing. And my parents were like, mm, hope she turns out okay. But they let me do it. And then I put it aside for a while. And then when I was, you know, 10 years later, I started my blog, which has now become my full-time business and gives me the opportunity to speak with people like you. And so it, little did they know, they didn't, you didn't know, know, but they let me do it. And that, yeah. has, that changed everything. No right. one knew. Yeah. But it was that spark, like you said, and it was exciting. Wait, so I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I have an observation, which is that you've taken the blogging and you've taken the horses and you put them together, right? Um, and secondly, yeah. it was, what was your blog yeah. about? Yeah. It was of course, <laughs> it was, a, it was course. a horse blog, right? Of course, yeah. Hello. So, um, yeah, and it, it's yeah, and I, I went to, when I went to college, I'm like, well, that was the end of that. Like, that was a weird little high school thing, and then little did I know, here I am. So, but it was that if they had squished that, or they had said, why don't you go do something organized mm -hmm. instead? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, that would have been lost. Yeah. So, I will say though, even as a parent now, like I know know that from my own childhood and how important that was, and I pri we prioritize that with our kids you know, we do, we homeschool, so they get a lot of free time and they have, they do 4-H oh, here and great. there, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of free. Yeah. But they, they still have a mm -hmm. lot of free time. Like right now they're out playing uh -huh. in the yard, right? Uh -huh. They're just running free. It's hard in our culture though. Like even me, even though I know in my head, that's good. There's a lot of that peer pressure in mom's groups. Like, oh, your kids aren't in violin and ballet and piano and swimming mm -hmm. and 4-H and basketball and softball. And, <laughs> ah! and it's like, you're not doing enough. You know, you're not doing enough. Well, you, you only have, you're only gone one night a week. I'm gone seven nights a week with our activities. And so do you have any advice for, for moms who are maybe listening to this interview mm -hmm. um, and they want to have more free time, but there is that cultural push. Like if you don't do all the activities, your kids are going to be behind. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, there's your story and there's Jeff Bezos's story, which is behind when, I mean, they'll be behind at soccer if everybody else is at soccer camp, uh, but they won't be behind at developing and they won't be behind, behind at sort of coming into their own. Um, so behind is a relative term. Uh, but I do have some really great news, which is that, um, so Let Grow is the nonprofit that grew out of free range kids. And uh, it was started when um, John Haidt, who wrote The Coddling of the American Mind. Uh, oh, I yeah, love that his, book. Me too. <laughs> and um, anyways, he was speaking with a man named Daniel Shuckman, who used to be the chairman of FIRE, which fights for free speech on campus. We're worried that kids were getting to campus and they were mistaking feeling uncomfortable with feeling unsafe. OK. And they're like, why is that happening? I mean, the, the, the rates of kids going to, you know, the mental health counselors, which I applaud. You know, I'm not anti therapy and, and admitting you need help. But it was sad that there's so many kids who need it now, so many tens of times more kids than have needed it before. And they're like, why are kids so fragile? It must be something that happens when they're younger, not when they walk on campus, because somehow it's a new generation that way. Who is fighting the overprotection that's sort of undermining kids today? And so they came to me. And so, um, so we started Let Grow, and we decided that it is really hard, like you're saying, to be the mom who decides I'm not going to put my kids in something or I'm just going to give them free time and let's see where the chips fall. So you can't be an individual really changing everything in your community or being the only one who's sending your kids to the park because there's no one else for the kids to play with and maybe somebody's calling 911. But if you get a group of people to change together, you can change the social norms so that when you come to your mommy group, they don't say, I have my kid in five days a week soccer and you're not doing travel soccer yet and he's going to be behind. So we, we recommend two things that we think change the norms completely and give kids back a lot of independence and free play. And I feel very fine telling you about these because they're both free. <laughs> All our materials are free. We're a nonprofit, mm -hmm. right? So one is um, the Let Grow Play Club. And I know that um, many of your people, uh, your listeners and fans are probably homeschoolers, but even homeschoolers usually have a group, right? That they meet with for something. Mm -hmm. So, um, at a Let Grow Play Club, there's an adult there just for legal purposes, really. But it's before or after school or at a homeschool group. And it's where all ages together just play. 
there's an adult there, but they don't solve the arguments. They don't organize the games. They don't suggest, why don't you do it this way? And if kids come, kids come up and say like, it was my turn, but she took the ball first. The adult says, thank you very much for letting me know. I'm sure you can solve that. Right. Or I heard of another teacher. I was just interviewing a teacher um, in St. Louis who's doing a play club where he sends the kids to the, I don't know, confrontation corner or compromise corner or something where it's like, I say something, then you say something, and then we compliment each other and then we shake hands. And kids get so bored with that that they figure out their own, <laughs> they, they solve their own problems after a few times. It's like, okay, okay, don't send me to the compromise corner. Uh, you can take yeah. your turn first. You know, yeah. let's just get back to it. And it really harnesses that desire, which is the desire of kids to have fun. And on the way to having fun, Mother Nature put all those difficult skills that you have to develop. So it is the compromise. It is the frustration tolerance. It is waiting your turn. It is um, everybody gets to vote on whether we should play it this way or that way. That's democracy. And sometimes you don't win. And sometimes you do. And sometimes you convince people. And so so if you have a chance for free play in kids' lives rather than even more organized activities, that's one thing you can do to give your kids back some some of this freedom and the importance that we've just been talking about in free play that has evaporated from kids' lives. And the other Let Grow initiative that's through schools, but again, you can do it through homeschooling or through just your home individual family, is the Let Grow Project. And that's where um, kids get the homework assignment that says, kids, uh, go home and do something new on your own without your parents. And then we have a list of things, but you know, you can make a leg, go play on the play, train tracks, go ride a horse, go play kickball, yep. um, climb a yep. tree, make a pie, whatever it is. And because all the other parents are doing it, everybody has to let go. And because the school told them they had to let go. And because the kids are comparing notes, I got to go get ice cream. Oh, really? I had to shoe a horse, <laughs> you know, then they, then you yeah. also renormalize this independence again. And we've heard from towns that have done that, where the schools have done this, where like, a kid goes to the store and uh, the grocery and at first people are like, where's your mom? And then after a while, so many kids come to the store, it's like normal again. So it is really hard to be the only parent trying to give your kids some free play or some independence. But that's why Let Grow exists to try to to try to do it wholesale, have a whole school do it free play and have a whole grade or a whole school or a whole school district or a whole homeschooling consortium send the kids off to do something new on their own. And then you reflect on it. I, I didn't think you had to. I thought like it's done and, you know, the fear is gone now. Everybody's proud. But you actually have to sort of think like, wow, I thought that was going to be so hard. And it was because I got lost, but then I got home. So it wasn't so hard. You do have to sort of, you know, it doesn't have to be an essay, but think back on like what you thought it was going to be versus how easy or fun or hard, but satisfying it was. And, and then you've broken through the barrier of anxiety and fear. And you're doing it in a group and you've changed your whole your whole norm hey friends i'm going to interrupt this episode for just a sec to answer a question that a lot of you have been asking me lately and that is do i still love my harvest guard reusable canning lids so last year i did a video about these lids and it kind of went viral and we ended up creating a backlog of orders for the Harvest Guard company. So it was kind of crazy, but as a result, a lot of you watched that video and were curious to know if I still like these lids all these months later. And my answer is yes, I absolutely do. Uh, I love that I can buy them once. I don't have to rebuy them constantly, which right now in this world of crazy, unforeseen shortages of materials, that's a huge bonus. Also, the sustainable part of me just really likes the fact that something isn't going into the garbage every single time I open a jar of home canned food. I will say my one caveat with these lids is that they do have a little bit of a learning curve. So I would recommend that you can your first batch with water. And if you want to see the whole process of how they work, because they're a little bit different than your typical metal lids, I'm going to drop a link to that video where I showed you how to use them down in the show notes of this video. But if you want to try them for canning season this year, you can do so over at theprairiehomestead.com slash canning lids. And if you use code homestead, you'll save 15% on your order. Now back to our episode. I, I guess I, I underestimated until you said that, which makes total sense, the value of the community in that. I've always just looked at this as a perspective of just mom here, mom there, you know, but like that makes complete sense that you need to have that community on board to get the change. Um, because it is hard to be the lone wolf on that for sure. It's hard if there is a lone wolf <laughs> to yeah. keep, keep yes. them inside. Yes. <laughs> right? 
Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, so what are like legal ramifications? Like, um, I, I know states differ, but what are the cold hard facts? Like what is considered illegal? Like if I let my kid ride their bike X number of miles, what's illegal and what's just like frowned upon? Right. It's, does, it, uh, does it vary a lot state to state? It's, it's not that exacting. It's not like you may go three quarters okay. of a mile at age nine and seven eighths of a mile when you are 10. It's not that. Um, what it is that's annoying in most states is that uh, neglect laws, the ones that allow Child Protective Services to come and investigate you, are, are vague enough so that um, they're sort of in the eye of the beholder. So if I think my child is old enough to play outside on the front lawn, um, but somebody driving by thinks, oh my God, that young kid and calls 911, then it's sort of up to the caseworker who thinks I wouldn't do that, or oh my God, that's so great mm -hmm. to see a kid outside. And so what we've done, what Let Grow, has done in four states to date, and believe me, it is hard to do this, is we've changed the laws. We've narrowed yeah. the definition of neglect in Colorado, Texas, Oklahoma, and Utah, so that it's not, you know, oh, you must keep proper supervision. Like what the heck is proper supervision of your kid? It says, neglect is when you put your child in obvious, likely, and serious danger, not just any time you take your eyes off your kid. So even if I don't, you know, I wouldn't let my kid play outside at seven, eight or nine. And you would. It's up to me, the authority to prove that that's literally dangerous. And generally it's not. Okay. And so that puts it, that gives it the, the, um, the decision making back to the parent. They can confidently think like, this is what I would do. And the other thing is that sometimes you don't want to leave your six and your seven year old home alone, but your husband's car broke down and now you need to go get him at the side of the road. And so it's 7 p.m. and they're going to have to be there and it's two hours away. And it's like nobody's home to babysit them. OK, you know, the idea that that you're never allowed to deal with reality, that everything has to be Brady Bunch perfect every second or you're a bad parent is is an idea that must fall. Right. And that's sort of inherent in yeah. our in these yeah. changed laws. We call them they used to be called the free range parenting laws. Um, somehow people sometimes think free range means neglectful. So we changed it to it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, we changed it to um, reasonable childhood independence laws. And here's where I have to ask your your listeners a favor. Um, so I said we've passed them in four states. Each year we work in about five states and one or two passes them. It's, it's really hard to get a law passed, um, even when people all love it. And I have to say our laws are, are often, almost always, um, bipartisan in sponsorship. In Colorado, the most recent one we passed, we had two Democrats, two Republicans, uh, blacks and whites, you know, far right, far left. And it passed unanimously in both chambers because this is right. not a left or right thing. I mean, there's, you know, you can be a libertarian. It's like, you know, I don't want uh, jackbooted thugs coming to my door. And you can be, um, you know, a, a social justice warrior and say, like, look at the statistics show that poor people and minorities have more touch points with the authorities, which means more opportunity for them to come and judge my parent, their parenting and take away the kids. So statistically, yep. it, it is worse um, if you're poor and it is worse if you're um, a minority or person of color. And so together, both sides of the aisle recognize that, you know, you got to give parenting back to the parents and childhood back to the kids. So what I'm asking for, from your listeners is this. We are thinking of working this coming year in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Virginia, um, oh gosh, Nebraska, and I can't remember where else. Connecticut is sometimes on our list, sometimes Delaware, sometimes Virginia. Um, if you're from any of those and you have any stories either of um, letting your kids do something on their own, walk to school, play outside, wait in the car for a few minutes, Waiting in the car is okay if you're running an errand. It's when kids are forgotten in cars for hours that they are truly yeah. in danger. Um, if you let them stay home and somebody called 911 because they saw your kid at home. Um, if you have any of those stories, those help us um, in, in the, you know, when we're having hearings. So if you write to me, sure. I'm Lenore, L-E-N-O-R-E -E, at Let Grow. You'll put it in the, um, at letgrow.org. We'll put it in the, the notes or you can send it to info at let grow, L E T G R O W dot org. Just somehow drop us a line. I'm so easy to find. I'm America's worst mom. You can Google me instantly. And so just send us those stories. And even if nothing bad has happened, which I actually hope nothing bad has happened. Um, but if you're not letting your kids play outside because you're worried that somebody is going to mistake this for neglect or that you might, you know, have to deal with an investigation 
that's 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 the chilling effect of worrying about the the law being too broad. And so that that counts as a story for us too. Oh, sorry. So um, yeah. So please drop us a note with your story, and um, it helps awesome. us. Yes, I'm going to put that in the show notes as well. Oh, and great. You guys- if you're from those states, definitely shoot Lenore an email. Right. Because I know we have quite a broad audience, so I know we'll have some folks, hopefully, who can pitch in. Oh, that'd be fantastic. Um, right. You mentioned Amer- being called America's Worst Mom, yeah. uh, which is mind-blowing. But let's, that makes me think about the mom part of this, or the parent part of this conversation. We talked a lot about the effects on children right. in this helicopter culture. How about the effects on parents and moms? Well, we were talking about this a little before, the fact that it seems a like a, a backlash against women um, making their way in the, the world of work and the world of men. And what's really sad is it's a drag. I mean, what, I was just writing a piece, yeah. this piece I have to finish when I hang up with you, about how, like, here's a crazy idea. How about the next time you have a big party, have the parents indoors and the children outdoors, yeah. <laughs> which is not, you know, it's old fashioned on purpose, right? But the fact of the matter is then everybody has more fun. You know, you're not saying, honey, do you want this? Do you want to take the crust off this? Did you want to finish the soda? Oh, don't drink that. That's a little too much for you. Do you want, you know, it's boring for anyone who's having a conversation with you because suddenly you're in, you know, crust land and the kid is not playing with their kid. They're a friendly kid, you know, the other kids and figuring out how to make the kickball game work or who can climb the highest in the tree. I mean, there's just a... It's so relentless, the demands that are put on parents. You have to sit there through every birthday party. You have to sit there through all the soccer practices. I mean, it is stultifying. And we are more than just our children's watchers, right? And sometimes one of the suggestions that I gave in my book that I still think is great is, you know, if you're with all the other parents and kids at the bus stop waiting for the bus to come and making sure that your child is going to get on it safely and waving goodbye like they're going off to Vietnam, um, just offer to watch all the kids, right? I mean, there's something mm-hmm. about like one for all and all for one instead of saying, I want to do it that way. Be the be the nice person who says, look, at this is not a big deal. I'm sitting here with my kid anyway. I'll watch all your kids. And if And if the parents are too nervous, say, well, I'm going to leave my kid with yours because I trust you. And I don't think it's so terrible at the bus stop where there's three adults and five kids that I have to be here too. So what you're doing is not only renormalizing the idea of trust and community, you're also asserting that like, I can be a good person and not be watching my child every single second because that's not what the job entails, right? Uh, And yet I hear from people once in a while, actually I haven't heard from people recently, maybe because it's COVID, about like their schools won't let any children get off the bus at the bus stop unless there's an adult there to walk the kids home, mm-hmm. which means like, moms, do you mind just quitting your job? <laughs> or yeah, and nobody right. minds if you leave the surgery room at uh, 2.30, right? So you can be at the bus stop by three. Yeah. I'm sure that liver will insert itself. So you just have to um, to recognize that our job has only recently been rewritten, rewritten to be one of constant supervision, intervention, and assistance. And you're allowed to have a life besides that. Yes. Preach. Yes, absolutely. And that's what I see a lot is, yeah, you are preaching. I like it. <laughs> it's my kind of sermon. Um, a lot, a lot of moms, I just see exhaustion and I yeah. watch them and I'm exhausted. I mean, I'm exhausted for them. And I, I, it's hard cause you know, my kids are out running, climbing trees and they're hovering. And I'm like, I don't know how to say, I mean, you can just say it. Sometimes it's touchy. Like it's easier if you just stop doing that. It, it gets easier, right? You know, every parent parenting job can be difficult. It has its days, but it's a lot easier when they, you just, that autonomy is a good thing for everybody. Right. Involved. So that's, so one of the things that you can do, I mean, nobody wants to be told they're doing it wrong and my God, we are, you know, you're, you're too help, you know, you're helping too much. You're helping too little kids need support. Kids need freedom. Just, just do it yourself. And like, you know, people will see that it's, you're sitting on the bench and you're not running to the slide, even though your kid just, you know, bruised a knee. It's like, okay, you know, this is okay. And that's why, I mean, you know, really I was free range kids by myself lecturing around the world for 10 years and people all nod along, right? They go, oh yeah, that makes sense. Oh, I love my own childhood. Oh yeah. Freedom's good. And you, you really, the, 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 you can't do this alone thing is real. You need Mm -hmm to articulate it with some other people that like, you know what I read? I read the kids are really anxious these days. And maybe one of the reasons is that 
the same reason you're anxious at work. If your boss is looking over everything you do and suggesting, why don't you try it this way? And are you done yet? And how's that? And nobody likes to be micromanaged and that includes kids. So if we stand back a little, they can breathe a little and we can breathe a little. And it's not neglect. It's not laziness. It's not, I, I don't even like people always say like, oh, Lenore, you, you recommend benign neglect. It, the word neglect is still in that phrase and it's not neglect. Yeah. It's trust. It's trust. And one, I was at a lecture once about something else. It's just for women. I don't even remember what it was, but um, the, the lady, the, the lecturer had us all close our eyes and think of somebody who made us feel terrible about ourselves. And, you know, whoever it was, me, it was a horrible old boyfriend. Okay. You wake up and you open your eyes and it's like, and where did you feel it? Oh, in my stomach. Oh, it was like a you know, weight on my shoulders, a headache, whatever, you know, my heart was pounding. Okay. Then she makes you close your eyes and think about the person who really believed in you, you know, who thought you can do it. I, you know, just the, the trust that you had something in you. And when I opened my eyes after that, I was crying because I was thinking of my fantastic, you know, not just my parents who also believed in me, but my seventh grade teacher who took junior hires on archaeological digs and trusted us to, you know, to dig in the boiling hot sun and, and find artifacts and take care of them. And, and then she dragged us around to garden clubs to give lectures. And uh, the point is that if you have your friends do this, you know, the ones who are afraid to let go and you, and they start to realize like how great it felt to be trusted by somebody, even to be believed in, even before you believed in yourself, that's, yeah. That's who we can be for our kids, but you can't be that if you're always doing this because they know that you love them, but you don't trust them. You think they're going to be hurt. You think they're going to be doing something dumb. You think they're going to be wasting their time. So to show kids that you do believe in them, taking a step back is, is a real boost for them. So it's not being neglectful or yeah. uh, lazy. It is giving them something really formative. And if you can have people do that little experiment on themselves and they realize like, oh, it's great when people believe in you and you have to show your kids you believe in them by not always being there, it makes it easier for them to take a step back. And, and the phrase we use is yeah. um, when adults step back, kids step up. Ooh, I like that. That's good. That's one of our yeah, zillion I, trillion I, I, phrases. You have so many good. I know you have amazing <laughs> platform. You guys definitely go check out um, all of Lenore's online presence because she's there you done go. a lot. There's a lot of good stuff. But I also um, feel compelled to tell yes. you guys that I'm wearing this hat, not just because I hate my hair, um, mostly because I hate my hair, but I also thought like old fashioned on purpose. This just struck it's me adorable. the thing it to do. Uh, I'm not quite as nutty as I probably look right now. No, I think, I don't think anyone's wore that spectacular of a hat on this podcast ever. So if you have that designation. I, maybe I'm starting something. Yeah. <laughs> and you're starting something. Mm -hmm. What can parents do? I mean, I have a homestead. I, I can turn my kids out in the pasture and nobody calls the cops and the kids can go play and run. It's e I feel like it's easier for me. What if someone is in a, a city like, I don't know, New York City, how can they do some of these things uh, mm -hmm. and give their kids these opportunities? Well, at the risk of both repeating myself and sounding like I'm selling something, get your school to do the Let Grow Play Club. There's really okay. no place else that I know of where there's a um, a quorum, you know, a ready-made gaggle of a bunch of kids of different ages in a place that you could be in a dangerous neighborhood, a safe neighborhood there. You've sent them to school for seven hours, have them stay eight or, you know, the other two to just play. If you have a play club, really, we're talking to the Surgeon General. We've had three or four talks with the Surgeon General, who I think is going to come out with a, I don't know what it's called, but like a report that says schools should be doing this. Um, because schools should be doing this and it doesn't take much. In fact, it can be free if you and some other people volunteer. And so you're not going to have a chance for kids to just be playing on their own by wishing for it. You have to make it happen. And schools are the easiest place, but you could do it at a YMCA. You could do it at church. You could do it at, um, th there's a retired parks and rec guy who just wrote to me yesterday. I'm going to say, okay, go take over the parks and recs world and have them, instead of just offering basketball classes and such and jump rope competitions, have them offer a nice stretch, not just an hour, two hours if you can, of yeah. free time. And the Surgeon General is obsessed with loneliness, which I understand because it's especially after COVID, it's just a horrible thing. But when I interviewed these fourth, third and fourth graders who had been in a play club, they just kept talking about how they loved it. And if, on the days when there was no play club, they would just go home and they'd be on their iPad or their parents' computer. And 
And they actually think that's fun. And there is fun to it. I'm not against it. But they said, but then you take off the headset and there's no one there. And that's loneliness. So yeah. the way kids make friends is by playing with them, by having time to play with them, by having space. Don't even need a lot of space. You need some, you know, you could have jacks, you could have a ball, you could have cups, you could have cardboard boxes. Just give them some free time and they will find something to do. They will find their path and they will find a friend. Yes. I love that. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have, as you were talking about the kids going home on the iPad, do you have any suggestions for maybe parents who are thinking, I love the idea of free play, but my kid has become used to sitting in the house on the iPad or the device. How do you kind of help the kid break out of that cycle? <laughs> I know, you tell me, do you think, a, do you think yeah. a play club might help because there's no <laughs> devices a, yes, at the play club? For sure. And the other thing, I actually got another idea once from um, Audrey Monk. Audrey Monk, who, who wrote a book called The Happy Camper or Happy Campers. She used to be the head of a camp. Maybe she still is. Um, set aside a chunk of day that is almost, um, it's like setting aside a chunk of day for, uh, I don't know, bath time or whatever. It's like, you know, oh, it's 12 to 2 during the summer, honey. That's your, you know, outside time. See ya. And so it's not like, please get off the iPad. You've been on there all day. It's just, it's just. Uh, you know, like God decreed from 12 to 2 or from 12 to yeah. 4 or from 11 to 6 is outside time in the rain, in the snow. And yes. um, and then it's not negotiable because it's just the way it is. Just like you have a bedtime, you have outdoor sure. time. So that struck me as good. Um, the other thing is to uh, Peter Gray, who I work with, who was one of the co-founders yes. of Let Grow, G-R-A-Y, fantastic. Everybody yes. loves him. Real free to yes. learn. Um, you know, Playing video games is sometimes the only way kids can get together because they aren't out on their bikes and they aren't out at the um, on the back forty with the uh, you know the the uh, defunct railroad going through. So uh, you know there's something to be said for even the social interactions that kids get that way because if if there's nothing else that's unsupervised, at least they're unsupervised a little, not structured by an adult when they're playing those games. But really. Yeah. Peter also always quotes the study that was done of kids online where they asked, would you rather be online playing this game or playing outside with your friends in real life? And 80 something percent said outside with real friends. So wow. you have to make those opportunities happen and they don't happen spontaneously the way they did in my era, the way they do on stranger things. Yes. Um, so you have to, you know, ask your school or your church or even a, a neighborhood group Richard Louv, I'm sure you know him. He wrote Last Child I in love, the Woods. Yep, love that one too. You're, you're seeing all my so, favorite books. Yes. Okay. Right, right, right. So <laughs> Monday is, you know, Lenore's uh, time that she sits outside. And Tuesday is Jill's day when she sits outside. And anyone who wants to come outside, send their kids outside, they know that there's an adult there. You okay. know, that's, that's not a bad idea either. Just so long as yeah. the adult is just sitting there reading their book and not involved. <laughs> so what I'm hearing is, it's possible, but it's going to take more intention than maybe the parents of the fifties. Like we can do this, but it's going to be, take some concentrated effort, not bad, right. effort, not hovering it's, effort. Just we're going to have to yeah. think through it as parents. Yeah. Right. And talk to a couple neighbors and make it happen or yeah. your sister-in-law yes. down the block or whatever it is. So yeah. yeah. Um, like I said, I think the easiest place is school because they're mm -hmm. already there. <laughs> yes. But uh, if the school says no, there are alternatives. Okay. And if a mom wanted to start a let grow, let grow play club, um, mm -hmm. because I know a lot of my mm -hmm. listeners are in kind of obscure rural areas, they might not already have a club. <laughs> it's not, not, not in urban centers, right? Is there all that information right. on the website? They can figure out how to start one and get it off the ground and all that stuff. Right. We have, and all, like I said, it's all free. So we have the implementation guide for schools and we have the let grow play kit, I think it's called for adults. If you just noodle around and you look up mm -hmm. let grow play club, um, and then also we have a let grow project for schools to do the homework assignment where kids have to go home and do something on their own by themselves. Um, and then there's a, a home version, I guess you'd call it, you know, which we put out during COVID for if you just want to do it from home. It's things are better with another person, even if it's just you and another, you know, mom or, or cousin or something, both sending your kids. One of the things you can do is go to Starbucks together. Um, depending on how rural you are and uh, go to the cafe, uh, go to the old watering hole and you yeah. sit there with your friend and then you send the two kids off together. You can be working together on your computers and send the kids outside. Yeah. It's much easier to keep a kid outside um, doing something when they have another child to play with. So 
make it easier on yourself and normalize it for two of you at once. I like that. Yeah. Everything's more fun with a friend for parents and yeah. the kids. I agree. Right. And, and they'll argue and that'll be good. And they'll yep. compromise and that'll be good. And somebody will fall. That'll be great. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so. You gotta, you gotta have the skin knees. Right. It's just part there of the you go. It comes, right. comes with yep. the territory. Um, well, Lenore, we've covered a lot of territory. This has been fantastic. I've been looking forward to this interview. Um, and I want to yeah. be respectful of your time because I know you have a million projects going on like gotta, I do. Gotta, but gotta go right about, um, yeah, the strange things. Right, things. But yeah. Yes. Any other right. last minute words of wisdom? Maybe we didn't cover something you wanted to say. Anything to just leave our audience with? Yeah, it's, it's really impossible when you're with your kids not to jump in because you're always going to see them doing something that seems a little risky or maybe mean, or, you know, it's going to, you're going to ruin your friendship that way. And, or there's an easier way to do it. Why don't you try this? And that's why I don't blame parents. I don't blame helicopter parents because when you're with your kids, when I'm with my kids, when I'm, my kids, they're in their twenties. I'm like, why aren't you looking both ways? You know, because they're, they're not looking both ways because I'm crossing the street and I'm an obsessive yeah. lady, you know, so I'm looking both ways and they can just be looking at their phones and following me. So the only, I don't blame parents for jumping in because when you're with your kids, you will. It is impossible not to. So the only answer is to not be with them. <laughs> and that's why it's the culture. The culture has pushed us to always be with our kids and therefore we are intervening. It's not like we're obsessive interveners and we're annoying, paranoid, you know, uh, budinskis. It's a culture that says you must be with your kids and once you're with them, you optimize, you try to make things yeah, better. So you sure. got to get away. So they learn how to start optimizing their lives instead of just waiting for you to tell them what to do. Excellent. So wise. I appreciate that. Um, wisdom. Makes yeah, sense. Wisdom yeah. It's all good. Yeah. So thank you so much again. I appreciate your time. This was fantastic. Um, for those of you watching and listening, we'll put all the information to find the let girl play club information and free range kids.com. And the contact address for Lenore as well, if you live in one of the states she mentioned, I think it was Pennsylvania, Michigan, Virginia, uh, Nebraska, and maybe Connecticut. Does that sound right? All right. So if you live in one yeah, of the states. And, and, and others, yeah, because we're coming to yours sometime. Yeah. yeah. So if you have some stories right. or some examples and you could help out, shoot them Lenore's way. So thanks again. Thanks. I've, this was fantastic. I appreciate it. Thanks. Well, uh, you know, some people accuse me of being old fashioned on purpose. So this was the perfect place for me to come. You found your people. Here we are. There you go. Right. All right. Thank you, Jill.